Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to FYI, For Your Innovation Podcast. My name is Ren Leggy. I am a Client Portfolio Manager at ARK Invest. I'm joined by my colleague, Brett Witten. Uh, he's the Chief Futurist at ARK Invest. Uh, so, Brett, you've been uh, the Director of Research at ARK since the firm's inception back in 2014. You recently earned the, the title of Chief Futurist. Maybe we just start there. What, what, does, that, what does that entail as a Chief Futurist at ARK? We've always focused on modeling technologies from the top down and and from the bottom up and, and focus on the granular you know, company level details and figuring out how broad, how big, you know, how much scope and scale these companies will have over the medium and long term. And um, we actually restructured kind of the, the research organization because we were going to hire more talent because there's evidence that these technologies are, they're actually coming quicker than even we anticipated. And so as part of that, um, we're kind of desegregating uh, kind of the the top down um, kind of what does this technology look like five and 10 years away from some of the bottoms up work. And so as the chief futurist, I'm, you know, making sure those those um, medium and long term forecasts are really well tuned and consistent across technologies and that then they're being appropriately applied to um, kind of the the individual securities and companies that that we're analyzing and and so the i think there's never been a more opportune moment to focus on the future because it it, it really is happening faster than you can imagine uh and and so it requires actually um you know really well-tuned long-term forecasting because in a that those long-term forecasts are flowing into company results you know more quickly than than they were even five years ago um so as chief futurist that's my focus i think arc as a whole is a very future focused firm so if you look at what's happening in any of the innovation platforms that we focus on in in ai or or um public blockchains or, or multi-omic sequencing or robotics you know or energy storage to, you know the electric vehicle revolution it it's all uh infiltrating you know multiple sectors and um and in this very very tangible position of inflection right now at this moment uh and so the intention for us is to well we need to even understand the world even better we need to understand how these technologies are going to change in, in a more profound way uh and and we're leaning into that uh, and so it's a lot of fun and why would you say our kind of focuses on disruptive innovation? I mean, like, what's the, what's the size and scale of these opportunities, and why? What makes kind of Arc more uniquely positioned to kind of capture it and better understand it than than the rest of the market? Well, I think future historians will look back on this moment, and they may even look back on November of 2022 and say, "Wow, that was when Chat GPT was released." which has a silly name, but um, an AI chatbot that is performative as that product and that is accruing users at an unprecedented velocity um, probably marks an inflection point in history and the capability of software in people's hands. And so the the it's very clear to us, that's just one example, but that this business cycle is going to be seen as the business cycle where technology changed everything. Uh, and so as an investor, as an asset manager, as somebody that, who's stewarding a pool of capital, we think that the best way to position yourself in a technological boom 
is to focus directly on those technologies and guide your assets on the basis of your understanding of those technologies. Um, the way in which we, so disruptive innovation is, I think that the right way to manage money, particularly in this moment where, you know, collectively the innovations that we focus uh, on are worth roughly around $10 trillion today. And we think by the end of this business cycle, uh, more than half of equity market cap is going to be attributable to these disruptive innovations uh, versus, you know, maybe it's 10% or so today. Uh, and so there's a huge tailwind to um, asset owners in the space that we want to take advantage of. And we focus on disruptive innovation because people have a lot of exposure to disruptive innovation on the short side that they don't even realize. Uh, and so we think it's a, a real service to clients to be a pure play disruptive innovation manager when they may have a um, you know traditional rail company in their core index holdings uh, that will be severely disrupted if, as we believe, electric autonomous trucks price cost competitive on a ton mile basis with freight rail. And, you know, that's one example, but across every sector, I could name one where um, it's typically a very large kind of industry in the core portfolios that is really subject to risk. Uh, and so we think um, by focusing both as a, an allocator and, and a, an investor on disruptive innovation is a way to actually de-risk your portfolio against the disruption that's coming. Uh, and, um, you know, so then why, why should we be very good at it? We, we are, um, we've aligned the research team and portfolio process directly against innovation. Um, we uh, are analysts are experts in the technologies and focused on the technologies, which gives them a, a real competitive advantage against um, sector specific specialists who an auto analyst, you know, would just take the word of the CEO of the auto company that, that electric vehicles were not going to be cost competitive within the forecast horizon. That's clearly wrong, but that's what they're being told. And so it gives our analysts a an unfair advantage as these technologies um, cut across sectors. Um, we intentionally look through the business cycle for how much these technologies will be worth, which is really important for steep cost declines. The the results of that doesn't manifest in 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 um, you know a quarter or two, but over three and five years, you unlock a lot of unit demand that the the street often un, doesn't anticipate. And so we have a intentionally longer term point of view in our underwriting framework and how we analyze the companies that we expose ourselves to, uh, and we are transparent. Uh, we uh, publish our research. We are very active on social media, sharing our findings. And we do that because that's the way to understand more quickly how big or not big uh, a particular opportunity is going to be. And it's particularly important because these technologies are, are platforms on top of which other innovations are being built. And you cannot underestimate the, you know, how much stuff will happen on top of them. The, the velocity is so quick. And so, um, you know, our team is always in a learning mode, which is really, really critical and important and, and very kind of against the grain of traditional Wall Street, which tends to not share information and, and not want to be open about really how it believes and feels. Uh, and so those factors that we have a longer term point of view that our analysts are focused at the technology level itself and when technologies are cutting across sector and that we use kind of the, the power of the world's kind of information networks by sharing information with it, which provides us with information back uh, against innovation platforms, allows us to have a better sense for the direction that the world is moving and, the, and how big these technologies are going to be. And so... That's both why we do it and, and how, you know, I think we've succeeded over time at doing the forecasting that we've done and how we'll succeed into the future. And you mentioned you focused on a longer time horizon, right? But we're certainly in this macroeconomic environment faced with a lot of short term headwinds, right? 20, last year and, and still we're focused on uh, investors and allocators are focused on rising interest rate environment, entering into a recession. You know, these are challenges uh, in the short term. You know, we'll see how we overcome them. But do you, in your view, do you think that has, an, has had any impact on the technological progress of any of these innovations? Like if you look back at 2022, right, you mentioned chat, GPT. Like has there been other breakthroughs that 
have largely been unaffected by what's happening in the macroeconomic environment? Yeah, across every area, innovation seems to be churning along. For one thing, we're really grateful for our clients. Our clients have stuck with us, you know, and and really understand that innovation is inherently volatile and that, um, you know, because we are investing in, in the promise of future cash flows. Um, if people are feeling nervous and want cash flows today and are shifting back into kind of their core indices because they just want to feel safe, that um, that flow will cause underperformance in our names. Uh, you, you know, there's a saying that in the short term, the market is a voting machine. In the long term, it's a weighing machine. Well, we really try to play the weighing machine game as in we measure the companies at what we believe is their fundamental value five years forward and act as if we're a forced seller to somebody just for the cash flow they can generate at that time. And that's how we underwrite positions. But we don't try to directly play the macro cycle as in make a, a market call. We think the service that we provide to clients, for instance, we don't go into cash or anything, right? Because off the, the bottom of a turn is when you can get a lot of a, a move in the market, particularly in flow sensitive names. And so we think that the service that we provide to clients is to be exposed to innovation and 100% exposed to the innovations that we think have, uh, you know, amazing compounding opportunities over the medium term. And I think that's why clients have stuck with us is because we say what we're going to do and, and we do it and we follow the process without kind of deviating because if they, you know, um, are feeling relatively nervous, they can go into cash with, you know, other parts of their allocation portfolio. And there are some companies that, uh, you know, these companies are uh, capital market sensitive to some degree, as are all companies. So I think if you've been paying attention to the news, there's been a lot of tech layoffs. And those tech layoffs are are in part because uh, their stock prices are down. And so the cost of that talent is up because they compensate in equity to some degree. And for um, companies in the earlier stage space or in the startup space, um, if it, they're having to stretch their balance sheet between funding rounds over a longer period of time, or they're getting balance sheet sensitive, they begin to assess, hey, these are all the programs we're working on. What is really core to kind of the mission of moving this company forward? And sometimes that can be a very constructive kind of set of decisions to, to really trim off some Baroque, you know, projects that, that don't actually, you know, address the core mission of the company. And, and sometimes companies get impaired if they have too thin a balance sheet going into to those circumstances. And so um, from a from a modeling perspective or from an understanding the company perspective, we're, of course, we're very um, balance sheet focused and, and, and understand the money that we believe is going to be required to get to the finish line. Largely at both the technology level and the individual company level, um, the companies that are exposed to innovation are one more profitable than I think people understand and that a lot of these companies are um, even if unprofitable they have um, you know clear glide paths towards profitability and towards cash flow positivity that allows them then to to build on top of the strategic platforms they've built in the technologies and I'll also say it's it's not just AI it's across every sector or, or every innovation platform there's there's evidence that things are happening quicker and partly it's because you know, an advance in AI feeds into every other innovation. You can't have uh, autonomous vehicles without having a strong neural net driving them. And neural nets are moving more quickly, which, you know, increases the odds we think of a robo taxi network commercially scaling, um, you know, in a really profound way. We believe that blood tests that will be able to diagnose early stage cancer are going to become pervasive and, and really part of a standard of care. This creates a tens of billions of dollars sized market uh, that didn't exist a couple of years ago. Uh, and part of the way and reason that's going to happen is because we're getting data, not just off the sequencing machine, but, but also data from your digital health records and data from a layer on top of your DNA that controls which DNA is expressed. And that being able to take all of those orthogonal streams of data and compress them together to understand whether or not somebody has a, an otherwise undetectable or early stage cancer from a, from a vial of blood 
is an AI problem as well as a biological sciences problem. Uh, and so, you know, you pick you pick an innovation, there's both a sign that it's really moving, that it's at a critical stage of inflection, and that it's in some ways informing another innovation and that in innovation's informing it and catalyzing its growth. I've never in my life seen the market be so muted to innovation when there's so much evidence on the ground that innovation is increasing in velocity. If you had released all of this AI material two years ago or two and a half years ago, the market reaction would be profoundly different. And so it's it's just interesting how the market cycle can be totally offset from the innovation cycle. And I think it's a great opportunity to get exposure because you have you know mind-melting advances that are available, I see them as on the cheap at, at bargain brace, basement prices. And, and, and that's when, you know, as an allocator, you should be uh, aggressively deploying capital into a space that has a great set of tailwinds and it's being priced as if it's X growth. This is, you know, a wonderful opportunity. As an investor and allocator, right, when we're looking at these individual technologies, you know, they're perceived to be kind of early, maybe earlier stage or risky. And we've seen because of the macroeconomic environment, heightened volatility. You know, how do you how do you think about that? Like, you know, that they're maybe too volatile from an investor's perspective. Um, and how do you you know, how can you just gain exposure to these without taking kind of increased volatility within your portfolio? I mean, there's no question that this is you shouldn't put money into innovation that you want to like extract in a year or two. Right. And so, it, you know, it fits in into a portfolio allocation because, you know, you are allocating a portfolio. If you need the cash in six months or a year, even two years, I'd argue, you know, equity exposure isn't for you at all. Uh, the equity market, you know, there is no guarantee that the equity market's not going to be down 20% a few months from now. There could be a black swan event. I think that it's likely that we're going to enter a recession. Uh, at some point, I take solace in the fact that kind of the innovation names that we're exposed to, um, you know, have already discounted a lot of uh, damage to them individually, and they're and they're not as they're not as traditionally macro cyclically sensitive as in the the innovation during during kind of recession type events tends to actually take share um, because people are forced to reevaluate spending decisions and, and really innovation wins against inertia. If people stay with what they were doing before because they're feeling comfortable, then it's hard for innovation to gain traction. It's when they're having to make really hard choices that they look at the thing that they were kind of scoffing at before and say, hey, can we incorporate you know AI into our business processes and save ourselves money and continue to grow? There is uncertainty out there. There's uncertainty in the macro economy. There's certainly lots of uncertainty and argument about what innovation is worth. And so because of that, it leaves it more sensitive to people bailing into cash flow during uh, an interest rate cycle. Um, I think that volatility is inherent to the innovation space. And it's also a sign of how early we are in kind of the development of these innovations. But take chat GPT, you know, there's, we don't know exactly how many, but it's, you know, uh, millions, uh, maybe tens of millions, but not much more than that, who are using it today. Uh, and across all generative AI products, it could be, it's on the order of probably 30 million or 40 million users. So this is the, the stage, it, there is no question in my mind that there will be billions of users of this product over the next few years. Over the course of this business cycle, you know, these products will inform every software that people interact with, sometimes in profound ways. And so you're, you're going from units in the tens of millions to units in the billions. So you have, you know, multiple orders of magnitude of growth behind you. And uh, people don't know, it's hard to say what that's going to be worth. And so there's, you know, until people see the cash flow, um, they're not going to be stable in their assessment of value. So it means that it's more volatile until it gets to a stage where kind of like the final, like, oh, this is the equilibrium amount of cash flow that's going to flow into these models is going to be. Uh, and so the volatility is, is a sign of how early we are. Uh, and volatility, it feels bad on the downside, but it feels great on the upside. 
Uh, and so that's why, you know, particularly if you've had downdraft in the market based on an interest rate cycle, you know, getting innovation exposure as that's turning, it, it's really a savvy thing to do. Um, because, you know, our belief is that actually the assets are massively mispriced. Uh, and so if it's a responsible portion of your portfolio that you don't need in the next, you know, three or four years, uh, and I don't know, I'd ask you, Ren, what do allocators say is a responsible portion of the portfolio today? And, and what do you think is the actual answer to that uh, from your perspective? You say it's it's going to make up, you know, more than 50 percent of the global equity market cap. Um, I don't know if we're forecasting 2030. Right. But no way anyone's going to put 50 percent of the portfolio in it. Right. But if you think about the size of the opportunity and we've done some work on, you know, just how it kind of fits in a portfolio, because it is we look at it as a kind of a new asset class. I mean, it really doesn't fit into kind of a broader equity or even global equity kind of asset class because innovation, as you, you mentioned, it cuts across sectors, geographies, uh, market caps. And so, uh, and it's providing exposure to a lot of companies that are not held in broader based indices. And as a kind of a strategic, you know, as you're setting your strategic asset allocation targets, typically, and we've seen, I mean, this is a trend that's been happening for over a decade now. A lot of equity investors are moving more passive, and so they are overexposed to those uh, benchmark holdings. And as we continue to kind of dig into those um, these benchmarks, like NASDAQ, which is kind of using the tagline as an innovation index, which we would kind of disagree with, because when you look under the hood, you know, there's there's not much innovation really happening in in that index. And, um, you know, we're trying to kind of provide that with our portfolios to provide uh, investors and allocators with exposure to, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, gene editing, these technologies uh, that, uh, and companies that are the key enablers and beneficiaries of those technologies uh, that they otherwise would not have exposure. And, and you mentioned kind of, you know, if you're holding the benchmarks, you're basically almost short innovation because you just don't have those companies that are going to disrupt uh, these kind of, you know, these existing uh, companies and, and potentially even industries and sectors. If you believe me that it's going to be, you know, more than 50% of, of global market cap, wouldn't 50% be the right number? I mean, just, just, I, I know that from an allocator perspective, it's hard to convince an allocator to do that because it is volatile. Um, but conceptually, like, wouldn't that be the right thing to do? You're just getting ahead of where the indexes are eventually going to go. Yes. I mean, conceptually, it, it makes sense, right? If you believe that. I think as allocate, allocators think about it and they set their strategic asset allocations, they're also very kind of, uh, I would say even more so in the institutional space, they're very benchmark kind of centric, right? They want to set for each asset class or each strategic allocation, they need a benchmark to see you know, how they're performing. Are they underperforming, on, uh, outperforming? And if they're underperforming, they need to make changes, right? Now, you can argue that may not be the best approach. Now that kind of technology is seeping into every sector and every, every uh, industry, but that's how they think. And so innovation kind of has very high tracking error, right? And so it's been challenging for allocators to really kind of tag a benchmark to innovation so that they can make it a larger portion or, or make it a core holding in their portfolios. Uh, I think there's been some, you know, there's some, you know, MSCI has launched an innovation suite of indices. So, I mean, there's, there's going to be ways to kind of track it a little bit better, but really innovation and in the way we think about it, right, is it's pretty much agnostic to any benchmark because these are holdings that will likely become part of the benchmarks eventually. Yeah, I think one of the things that's happened is is um, that they they've managed to not do it in part because they feel like they get it through venture capital exposure, uh, and that has like this characteristic that's attractive to them, but it really actually shouldn't be that it doesn't mark to market as frequently or sometimes not at all. Uh, and so it's kind of like volatility concealing. It, it, it's like you own this asset and, and, oh no, it's, it's not moving. Don't worry about it. Right. But, but like 
if those assets were honestly marked to market, as in, you know, to uh, the daily liquidity or and minutely liquidity that uh, public equities are subject to, they obviously would be even more volatile than the public equity space. There's no question. It's, it's you know, much less um, thickly traded. Uh, you know, it is uh, subject to daily flows, there would be, you know, much more flow sensitivity there than there is in the public equity space. But the reporting requirements for, for you know, a private equity portfolio, and, and there's good reason for this, by the way, but the reporting requirements are, are such that, you know, sometimes assets are not being marked, you know, within a hedge funds book or, or a venture capital book, at least in a, in a um, robust way, except once a year or, or once a quarter. So allocators, or, or like this is great. I get to, I get the upside without having to see the volatility, even though the volatility exists. Isn't that a little odd? Isn't it like kind of like we're playing an accounting game, and 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 it seems like that should eventually resolve. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point, right? Just because you can't see it doesn't mean uh, it's not there. And if you have a long term time horizon, volatility, you know, shouldn't be considered kind of a bad word, right? And, and it's kind of taken that sense, you know, in the public equity markets, because you can see it on a real, almost basically real time basis. And on the private venture side, yeah, they, they, these are, you know, they're making investments that may not pay off for five, seven years. Right. And uh, in some cases, that's also true with uh, a lot of our holdings. So, you know, I think volatility also creates uh, when you have that ability or when you have that daily volatility, it actually creates opportunities. Right. Because innovation is inherently controversial. And so when you have companies reporting and missing on short-term expectations, they become more volatile, they may trade down, and that creates an opportunity to maybe start building positions in, in our uh, stocks. So I think, you know, that makes a good point. And also that we're seeing kind of, you know, I'm seeing as I talk to a lot of clients, you know, they're thinking about um, taking exposure down in the private because the valuations are just off between public and private. And so, you know, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, right? But um, this is an opportunity and it takes time because, you know, it's fairly a liquid asset class, but we're starting to see that transition and it's happened. I would say I've been hearing that for now, you know, almost two years that they're looking at kind of decreasing uh, private uh, or venture exposure because of the current economic environment. Um, but they're seeing opportunities from a valuation standpoint in innovation uh, within the public equities market. So I think it's creating opportunity, right, for over the long term for those that maybe only have 1% of innovation exposure in the portfolios, right? And you're saying 50, you know, it's somewhere in between, but it's an opportunity to kind of leg in, build that strategic allocation. Again, it may not be the core, right? But it certainly should be a sizable allocation that kind of at least moves the dial, right? At the end of the day, um, 1% is probably not going to do much. Uh, it's definitely better than nothing, right? But, um, you know. Well, it's kind of like if you, I, I like your idea that, you know, and, and I agree that volatility is is a an opportunity. Uh, there's two things I want to bring. One, volatility is an opportunity. Like an interesting characteristic of, of the venture side is, um, sure, if you were to mark those assets to market today, or mark them daily, you would get extreme price swings. Unfortunately, as an investor or allocator, you actually can't operate on those price swings, right? Because the, you know, the strong companies are coming to market when it's strategically in their interest, which is not on the downside of the price swing, right? Uh, so, uh, it's not as if, you know, you want an exposure to, to, um, Mosaic ML and you can automatically get it at a great price unless you have a relationship with Mosaic ML or unless you're like a, you know, expert in technology. Um, so you can't, you, or, or Stripe or, or SpaceX or whoever, you, you like the price swing doesn't give you the opportunity in the public market, the price swing, the opportunity is there. And so if you have a, um, an ambition to get to a, a strategic allocation, like the volatility is amazing to build up into that spot. And then it provides you a mechanism by which to essentially harvest that volatility into uh, the innovation exposure that you're looking for within your core portfolio. The other thing I wanted to bring up is I think there's a conflation between volatility and risk and, and 
the financial literacy material for for everybody, for allocators, for MBAs, that I think it's just wrong. Like the idea that because something you know prices uh, more volatilely implies that there's more risk embedded. It's just inaccurate and it affects all of the reporting on kind of allocations and people like even you know the idea of of tracking error it's like your venture portfolio would have a lot more tracking error if it were marked at the same way as as the public equity book and as i said before you know volatility is indicative of uncertainty which is not the same as risk if you've if you've underwritten the uncertainty in in a in a robust way and you actually think the uncertainty exists because it's mismarked relative to fundamental value then the volatility is not a risk that's a a sign that this is a great opportunity uh, assuming you've done your underwriting well i can understand why Volatility is conflated with risk. It's because a lot of people see volatility not as risk to kind of the overall appreciation of my portfolio, but risk to me in my relationship to my clients. Like I think, you know, it's natural for allocators and advisors to not want more volatility because they don't want to have to explain it and they want to, you know, pretend that things always go like magically up and to the right without deviating. Um, to, but I, that's actually the challenge of being a really good allocator of capital is being able to expose yourself to those opportunities that are mispriced and help your clients or your investment board or you know whoever you're answering to understand why it's mispriced, understand why the price action does what it does, and why it's a good exposure to, to not only keep, but to increase in kind of these circumstances. Yeah, and I think that's a good point, right? And um, on that note, right, it's important not to change your stripes, right, when, when things get tough, right, or, or uncertain. And, uh, you know, I think, and, and it speaks to the retention of our assets, right, we have not changed you know, our strategy, even in this very, you know, significant drawdown and bear market for the last well, two years, can you kind of maybe talk a little bit why you think that is and how important that really is? Yeah. I mean, the, um, for one thing, we, we, as I've expressed a number of times at the technology level, there is no question that innovation is happening, not just happening. It's going to change entire industries in profound ways. Uh, and and so by focusing at the technology level and then d demonstrating and detailing, you know, how much opportunity is there, it can then um, kind of translates into expectations at the securities level um, that suggests there's profound upside embedded in these positions. Uh, and so, you know, we think that the um, you really have to look through the business cycle to see the value creation that occurs. You, and you can go through the history of technology and see how it's happened. It's kind of like in computers, you went from kind of the hardware as being the dominant part of the value chain to the um, operating system being the dominant part of the value chain to the like the connected computers as a whole and the internet being the dominant part of the value chain to the the mobile you know device connected. Um, computers as a whole being the dominant part of the value chain. With each step along the way, you roughly increased enterprise value across the whole value chain. This is very rough, but by basically an order of magnitude. And so suddenly you have, you know, a multi-trillion dollar company in Apple that's sitting at the right spot in the value chain at the right time for kind of that technology exposure. Well, we think that that kind of the next operating system is going to be AI based and that there's going to be a changing of the guard. And that, you know, actually a lot of the um, mega cap tech companies are, are going to be put to risk because of that changing of the guard. And so as a manager of money, you know, we're, we're looking at, hey, can, is there a potential another order of magnitude increase in enterprise value associated with this kind of technology stack? And the answer is yes, absolutely. In fact, that, that honestly may be an underestimate maybe an accurate estimate. 
Okay. And so then we can say, well, if we're going like another step change up from here, you know, how do we expose ourselves to that step change up? And the problem, if you say, oh, well, yeah, it's happening, but right now, next three months are going to be a recession. So I don't know if uh, technology exposure is what I mean. You might miss a 50% move. Like you might be sitting there being like, well, I'm trying to, you know, get into this. If you look at the history, particularly of, of uh, investing in in asset classes with profound tailwinds, the, the dangerous thing to do is to try to like get really cute about your exposure to cash versus exposure to the asset class. It's really hard to um, market time. And so um, we think being fully invested and and just focused on the innovation space, both for us as um, kind of managers doing what we say we're going to do for clients, it's important. And I think for clients in terms of thinking about what is the future going to look like five years from now and what do I need to be exposed to to really make sure I take advantage of the compounding that could come based on these technologies. And and the answer is not, well, I'll, I'll see how a little bit of this cycle plays out before I get exposure. The answer is like, wow, you, you have an opportunity now. You have an opportunity now to be exposed to these tailwinds. Uh, and so you should be really, you know, measured, but aggressive in doing so. Yeah. I mean, you should also be disciplined, right? I mean, that's key for investors to really trust in the strategy to be a tool in their overall portfolios. Uh, and, you know, I think a lot of growth managers back in 08, 09, got caught off sides in, the, in kind of that aftermath because they deviated from their mandates. They, they were so benchmark focused. They didn't want to underperform, potentially lose clients because they se severely underperformed and they missed out on significant upside as the market started to rebound. Uh, and so because they weren't exposed to the, the growth names they should have been um, or that they were uh, very kind of uh, bullish on going into 08, uh, and so that deviation, you know, there's a, the loss, lo a lack of trust there now. And, uh, you know, we've gone through that pretty significant drawdown and we've kept to that discipline. We continue to do what we say we do, provide kind of the purest play exposure to innovation. And I think that's, you know, that's the other reason why our, our clients have, have stuck with us because um, they're they're thinking about this longer term. We're not, you know, like you said, we're not we're not um, uh you know, taking cat, you know, we're not increased, you know, we're not uh, going in cash and trying to protect necessarily in the downside, but that also warrants, you know, we're, we've been very transparent about that, right? So in down markets, we do and will likely underperform. Uh, and because we, we're not providing necessarily, we're not downside protection managers, right? There's plenty of great managers that do that. They can use exotic derivatives and stuff to, to hedge. That's not what we do. We're pro providing that pure play exposure uh, and we're positioning the portfolio as we consolidate to kind of for that next leg of growth, because we're thinking about this over a full market cycle. Right. So, I mean, I think that's what's kind of happened with, you know, the market. It's been, you know, we think the market's been wrong about these innovative tech, num tech names. Right. Valuations are down. They've been attacking unprofitable tech. Their consensus views going into this year have been very bearish. I mean, that's a kind of another question here. What, what do you think they're missing, right? What are they not seeing out there uh, that, you know, it seems so obvious to us, but not obvious to the market based on where these stocks are trading? Like some of them are trading at almost deep value. Even the phrase unprofitable tech, I think, is is like indicative of how the market miss miss understands what's going on in this space. It's like, look at Tesla. Might be the best gross margins in in the industry and growing, you know, 50% roughly or 40% year over year in terms of uh, units relative to an industry that's shrinking. Uh, and, and they have an entire, you know, software overlay potential to the um, story where if right now that... Uh, 25% or so gross margins they get on a vehicle sale, you know, that turns into gross profit, but it's a one-time event on a vehicle they've manufactured. If they can deliver scalable autonomous capability, um, then th they begin to generate operating profits off of every vehicle and fleet or almost every vehicle and fleet 
on an ongoing basis per annum that could be you know of equivalent size and maybe even larger than the profit they're getting off the one-time sale of each individual vehicle and so the entire financial characteristics of the company transform but they are massively cash flow positive today as well and in fact they don't they have more cash than they can efficiently reinvest as far as we can tell as in it would be nice if they could build uh you know even uh factories even even factories even faster even though they're building factories factories faster than than any automotive company in the world today and it's not just tesla if you look and and you probably have the statistic off the top of your head but if you look at the the names that we're exposed to uh, unprofitable tech is is not um a, a good um <laughs> way to phrase it in part because these companies are not only um you know have tremendous tailwinds and are, are on glide path to, to a lot of cash flow generation um but also their cost structure is is much more flexible than people give them credit for so uh if you like if you think about what these companies are doing with with research and development costs that is an investing in the future but it's also an investment you can defer if need be or stretch out over time if if you really get balance sheet sensitive much of the cost structure of, of these tech businesses is in the the human capital and the talent and that's much more easily dealt with relative to uh you know incumbents that are in the core indices who have big fixed cost structures often with debt against those fixed costs and that will get put really off sides in the event of um, getting disrupted by these innovations. Uh, and so I think that people, when companies are capital market sensitive, uh, separate from being macroeconomically sensitive, people look at kind of the, oh, this capital market sensitivity, it gets recursive where the stock price is down. So the cost of talent is up. And so uh, it, it, you know, the companies look relatively worse, but some of the characteristics that make them look relatively worse in um, kind of capital market sensitivity. Um, sensitivity measures actually put them in a much better position during actual macro downturns. And so one of the things that we've noticed over time with the innovation names is they tend to turn and outperform before the broader market kind of goes through a recession. So are really underwrites the, the macro cyclical slowdown. If you look in uh, even the global financial crisis, but across the board, um, the the innovation names tend to lead the market, uh, and and I think it's partly because of this dynamic where they can um, more agilely adjust to you know relative changes in the rate and funding, and um, and then the companies that get into trouble have to turn to them for products as as the recession hits because they need to right size their own cost structure and don't have nearly the flexibility in doing so. And we've seen uh, a lot of our companies, you know, raise capital when times were good in 2020, right? Their stock prices were elevated. They did secondary offering, offerings. And those were the companies that were probably hit the hardest because they had, you know, low cash balances and high cash burn, you know, when the, the pandemic first kind of hit us. Uh, and so they learned from that. Hey, let me get some, you know, this is a high cash burn business. I need to raise that capital. This is an attractive valuation. Let me stop, you know, beef up my uh, balance sheet and then, um, you know, be able to weather the storm if it lasts two, three years. So I think a lot of our, you know, from a balance sheet quality perspective, a lot of our companies are still sitting on, you know, if you look at their current uh, cash burn rates, you know, they're still sitting on at least almost two years worth of cash that can continue their operations. And like you said, they also have other levers to pull, you know, take down a little bit R&D, you know, if they have to, if it, if this continues to uh, get worse. Now, on that note, I mean, where uh, the latest uh, Bank of America fund manager survey said that cash levels are the highest since 9-11 in, in 2001. Investors are the most overweight bonds since um, April 2009. Uh, we're also seeing, you know, from the CBOE equity put call ratio, it, it surged above 2.0. I mean, it's the highest level on record, so that surpasses um, tech and telecom uh, bubble and bust, as well as the global financial crisis. So you have a ton of capital kind of sitting on the sidelines now. What do you think it's going to take to get that capital off the sidelines and start taking positions in, a, in innovation? 
it sounds to me it's not sitting on the sidelines. It's basically like a basketball that's being held underwater, as in they are like, you know, people are taking on, you know, negative or or less than one beta positions. Uh, and in my experience, typically the way this plays out is first the market rallies and the innovation names rally and people hate it. They think it's, you know, this doesn't make any sense and, oh, this is just a dead cat bounce and they have all kinds of short amps they use for it. And so in part, like it, um, typically on turns, it's not, there's not like a specific, hey, this is the reason this is happening. It's just like the marginal expectations of, of Fed tightening are diminishing somewhat. And then you will end up with either uh, company-specific catalytic events or um, kind of macro-catalytical events that cause everybody to kind of shake their head and 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 say, oh, wait, actually, these growth rates are not decaying in the way that consensus expectations have them decaying. And then if you have any reasonable expectation for growth on a go-forward basis, then there's actually a lot of embedded potential cash flow generation in these assets. So if you look across all of our companies and you look and this is probably, you know, it's true now. It's probably often true, but I think it's particularly striking now. Uh, if you look at the expectations for next year's growth, the year after is is kind of like cut in half again. Whatever. So the consensus expectations for tech names is 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 kind of like you get one year more year of growth, or for some of the companies, the growth rate is very low because they're dealing with still, um, you know compares to COVID and kind of like the choppy macro environment. And then the year after, as if kind of whatever they were offering, they fully penetrated the space. And and um, I I can guarantee you uh, that that the, the companies that were invested in have not fully penetrated, or at least in our view, um, kind of the spaces they're going into. And, and often they are in the, you know, single digits exposure. Again, back to electric vehicles, it's like uh, electric vehicles is I don't know, roughly, uh, it's less than 10% of uh, global vehicle unit sales. But we think that over the next five years, more than 90% of vehicle units, it'll be sticker price better to buy an electric vehicle. Forget total cost of ownership. Forget the fact that like a uh, buying a buying a, a a Model 3 today is lower total cost of ownership than a Toyota Camry. Uh, like the the upfront dollar you have to spend to get a better performant product that saves you money over time will be lower. And so it's clear to us that the entire you know motor vehicle fleet uh, buying behavior is going to have to change over. But the the companies are priced as if, well, whatever amount you've gotten, you get a little bit more and then it kind of diminishes off from there. And so even as that next year's kind of consensus results, as as these 1Q uh, numbers come in for companies and they begin to guide to what this year looks like, then that could actually cause like a cascading effect on expectations for top line growth where everybody's like, oh, actually they're still growing through this and there's a really bad macro cycle. So everybody else is like actually suffering from worse growth and worse profitability. Everybody else, I mean, core indices. And so um, it's actually the, all of these innovation names look actually quite a bit more attractive, not even just the long-term basis, but on the short-term kind of tactical basis, as in they deliver growth in in, in a growth-restricted environment uh, and better growth than people were anticipating. You know, that set of factors could cause, you know, a pretty severe tactical rally would be my my assessment. And we'll see. I mean, I think, you know, the nice thing about investing in 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 medium and long-term tailwinds is you don't have to be um, so catalyst sensitive. And in fact, often when there's a catalyst that people can point to and be like, that's going to be the thing. Well, that doesn't, then that's been priced in, right? Uh, and so I, I think that the long and medium-term story is, it's it's like much bigger and wilder than even we anticipated two and three years ago. Like what's happening in technology is it's, I've never seen things moving so quickly and never seen kind of the profundity of the products that are being launched as we see right now. And, um, you know, historically, when you have profound projects enter the marketplace, they capture profound amounts of cash flow 
and enterprise value. And that's what we think is going to happen. Uh, and so kind of with that as a context, it's, you don't, you don't need a catalyst. You actually just need to get exposed because the catalyst will be the cash flow that comes. You know, it, it, Microsoft is not dumb for investing in open AI and saying, hey, we're going to invest 10 billion in this opportunity. And there's a lot of other players in the value chain that are really interestingly positioned. You know, like uh, we think that there's, uh, that the size of the AI software market is going to exceed by multiples, the overall IT market global uh, this year. And the reason why is because the productivity advance you get off of AI software is going to be profound. And, and the, the, um, that impacts every single innovation sector. The genomic space is being super powered by AI. The robo-taxi opportunity, it requires AI to work. Robotics is, is suddenly is going from something you have to keep in a cage to something that can work right alongside a human uh, on the distribution center floor. And right now, people still think of robots as how many robots per 10,000 employees are in an operation. That's likely going to invert. Like the, the, it, it's, you're going to have more robots working in factories than you have humans. And that's a great thing. We'll produce lots of products for much less expensively than we were able to before. It's so clear that, that, that things are happening quickly. I think that people, you know, and it's nice that there's, that, that there's a great, great price point right now in our view. And over the course of this cycle, I think, uh, not guaranteeing when, but I believe that people who took aggressive innovation exposures at this moment will look really smart and they'll make their clients really happy. Uh, and, and that's what we try to do as well. You know, that's, that's why I talk to clients. That's why you talk to clients because I think it's the right thing to do is expose yourself to innovation. I think it's absolutely important. Uh, and this is the moment to do it. All right. I think we can end on that note. Um, as always, it's been a pleasure catching up with you, Brett. Uh, thank you for the time. And, um, you know, we have our big ideas 2023 coming out and, uh, that that's where we highlight a lot of the breakthroughs in these technologies and how big they could be over the coming uh, years. So I um, would encourage you all to tune into that as well. All right. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.